everyone, it's Miss Batty here, back with Lesson 7 in our series on Populations and Resources. What you're going to need for this lesson today is a pencil or pen, some blank or lined paper to take notes, or if you have the packet pages available, go ahead and get those out as well. Something that's optional, but that you might like to have open, is the digital model from Amplify, Populations and Resources Sim. We are going to be using this today to do some more investigations about how populations change or stay stable over time. If you don't have access, no worries, you can follow along with me. As usual, I also recommend that you find somebody over the next 20 to 25 minutes that you can check in with. Can you text a friend or find a family member to share your ideas and thinking with over the lesson? We have figured out so much about the moon jelly population. In our previous lesson, we got to see some evidence from their resource and consumer population. We found out that their resource population, the zooplankton, was increasing around the same time as the moon jellies. This is so important because from our studies, we have figured out that the resource population can have a large effect on the number of births in the, consume, the thing that consumes it. We also got to observe some evidence from the sea turtle population. And we found that it was decreasing about the same time that the moon jellies were increasing. Again, from all of the evidence we've been collecting, we have seen that when a consumer population is changing, that can affect the number of deaths in their resource population. Because we know population changes happen based on the ratio of births to deaths in a population, we know that this is really important information for understanding how and why the moon jelly population is changing. One thing that came up at the end of our last lesson is many of you realized that there are many other populations in the ecosystem. And that is where we are going today. Even though we have figured out so much about the moon jelly populations, there are still more questions to answer. Many of you noticed there was the algae, the walleye pollock, the orca, kelp, and sea urchin in the ecosystem and came up with this question, of could they be affecting the moon jellies as well? I want you to pause the video for a moment and take another look at our food web. Do you think that a population besides the moon jellies consumer, the sea turtles, or their resource population, the zooplankton, could have caused an increase or contributed to an increase in the moon jelly population so far? Share your thinking with a friend or family member. So this is going to be our focus question for today and tomorrow. How could a population besides the zooplankton or the sea turtles have caused or had an effect on the moon jelly population increase? As I mentioned before, we are going to get out the digital model to do some investigating. Now, because we are focusing on organisms in the ecosystem that are not necessarily directly related to the moon jelly, we are going to use the six populations digital model. We are going to look at and focus on organisms that are not directly connected to each other to see whether or not they can affect the population sizes of other populations. The six population mode introduces some new organisms or populations into the ecosystem. You might notice our green leaves, our wee bugs, and our furbles are still in the ecosystem. We've done a lot of testing with those populations and figured a lot out. Now we are hoping to find out a little bit more about ecosystems that have more populations in them. I want you to pause the video for a moment. What do you notice about these new additions? Hmm. 
Something that I noticed right away was that our furballs are no longer the head consumer of the food web. In our previous models, we only had the green leaves, the wee bugs, and the furballs. There was no consumer population for the furballs, so they were kind of at the top of the food chain. Now their consumer population is the scale beaks, and that even has a consumer population, the claw cats. The furballs went from being kind of at the top to the middle of the food web. I also noticed another type of relationship. The stingwings have the same resource population as the furballs. This is something we haven't seen yet before in our studies. We call this competition. Competition is when two or more populations use the same resource, such as the same food source. Notice, in this case, the furballs and the stingwings are in competition or competing for their resource population of the wee bugs. I want you to pause the video for a moment and check in with someone. What other kinds of competition can you think of? Can you think of any other types that might exist in an ecosystem? Hmm. Well, one type of competition that comes to my mind right away is the competition of sports. I played sports in high school and middle school, and in many sports, there are two or more teams that are trying to win a game or a race. There are also competitions for band and orchestra, where they go and compete uh, against different bands and orchestras from other schools. In an ecosystem, organisms might compete for things other than food sources. Did you think of any? The one that I was thinking about was something called a habitat or where they live. We also saw in the Energy Requires Reproduction article that there can be competition for mates, there can be competition for where populations or organisms lay their eggs or have their births. So there's lots of types of competition that is occurring in an ecosystem. We are going to focus on competition for food. In our digital model, we are going to focus on how does this new introduction of the stingwings affect the population of the furballs. We've already seen that we can affect the furballs by manipulating their resource population. When we increase the number of wee bugs, it increased the number of furballs because more energy storage molecules were available for reproduction. When we decreased the number of wee bugs, the opposite happened. Now we are going to see if by manipulating something that is not directly connected to the furballs can have an effect on them. If you have access to the digital model, now would be a great time to pause the video and start your investigations. We are focusing on how making a change to the stingwing population, so that's our manipulated variable, affects the population size of the furballs. So there is our responding variable. Remember, we want to make sure this is a controlled investigation. So the only thing that you should be manipulating is the number of stingwings. Everything else should be a controlled variable. Remember to run some time before and after you make your change so you can compare your data. If you don't have access, no worries, follow along with me and we will investigate together. All right, so as I mentioned, we are going to use the six populations setting this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and click in here and already we can see there are so many more populations in this ecosystem. So right now I'm just letting the time run. I uh, haven't made any changes. This is kind of our baseline uh, that we are going to be looking at. And I'm gonna pause it here right at about 40. Now, as we just spoke about, um, we are going to be looking at what can we do to the stingwing population or what occurs when we make a change in the stingwing population 
to the verbals, right? Because these are in competition. And we're trying to understand more about whether these two populations can affect one another, even though they are not directly connected. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, basically get rid of all of the stingwings. I'm gonna delete them out of the population or the ecosystem almost. I'm gonna lock that in. I'm not gonna change anything else because remember, we only should have one manipulated variable, um, which is our number of stingwings. The wee bugs, the green leaves, the scale beaks, claw cats, the oxygen, all of this are controlled variables in our test. So I'm gonna go ahead and click play. Um, we can see barely any purple now. The scale beaks uh, are almost gone, or the stingwing, sorry. Um, there really aren't very many left in our ecosystem. All right, so we just let the time run after I made my change, um, and now we're gonna analyze. And remember, our responding variable is to look at the number of furbles in the population. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, click over here, and we are going to take a look at what we are noticing. So in this first part of the time frame, um, the, the, the stingwings look pretty normal. Uh, they're kind of at a stable population. Um, they're at about 12, 12 to 14. Uh, it seems like the line is pretty straight. They're not really increasing or decreasing in size. Then we go ahead at this time and we almost deleted them completely from the population. Now, if you notice, uh, then our furbles are starting, it looks like, to actually increase in population. So they were at about um, 31 at this time. And as we're going forward, I see the number of births is increasing. And at the end of this time point, we, we have gone up to about 38 furbles in the population. Now, you also might have noticed um, that the wee bug population was also really increasing in this time. And the number of green leaves was starting to decrease. So there's a lot going on there and we, we might need to think about these other populations as well. But for now, our responding variable, the thing that we were focusing on was our furbles, right? And we can see that they were increasing in size actually as the stingwings were removed from the population. So it looks like the stingwings are having some effect on the furbles. And I bet if we would have let it continue out a little bit more, we only would have seen the furbles increasing in population size as the stingwings decreased in population size. But how can this occur? How do populations that are not directly connected in the food web affect one another? We received an email from one of our ecologists that is helping us study these moon jelly populations. Other ecologists have been studying jelly population increases all over the world. In a moment, we are going to read an article about two real jelly populations that are far from here, near the southern tip of Africa. One population increased while the other population stayed stable. Read the article carefully to look for the reason the jelly population increase was not something I expected. Learning about this real moon jelly e explosion will help you determine what is happening in the Glacier Sea ecosystem. So we're gonna go ahead and read this article and hopefully it might tell us a little bit more about competition or indirect effects in a population. We have seen that there is some effect on one another but we need to figure out a little bit more about this. Let's go ahead and read this article together. If you have access to the article and would prefer to read it by yourself, you can go ahead and skip over this part or pause the video. 
If you want to read along with me or you don't have access, go ahead and keep listening. Our article is titled, Jelly Population Explosion. Remember, our focus is going to be on how populations that are in competition affect one another. Let's go ahead and read together. All right, so we're gonna read an article uh, that's titled Jelly Population Explosion, How Competition Can Affect Population Size. So as I've mentioned before, I really like to start off by doing a title pre-think. Jelly Population Explosion. So it seems like this is going to be about um, an increasing moon jelly population, just like ours, which is maybe going to be helpful to us. I also see that it says how competition can affect population size. Um, and competition, again, I'm gonna, oops, it's not letting me add a note. There we go. I'm gonna add it to this one. Competition um, is when two or more things are competing or, oops, competing or trying to get the same thing, right? So um, that could be like a sports competition um, or for food perhaps or resources, right? Anything um, that they're both wanting. So let's get started with our article and see what we can find out. Jelly population explosions. In some ecosystems, the population of jellies has increased so much over a short period of time that people call it a population explosion. Ecologists, fishermen, and many other people around the world are concerned about jelly population explosions. In some places where jelly populations are getting bigger, the increase in population can affect human activities and the ecosystems we depend on. Okay, this seems really important. This is like the why we care, right? It, it affects human activities um, and we use the ecosystems. So if, um, if you are looking for a reason to, to think about why does this matter, right? We have the selfish reason that changes to ecosystems do affect humans. Masses of jellies damage fishing nets, clog water pipes for power plants, and drive swimmers away from beaches. Scientists around the world are hard at work trying to understand why these population increases occur and how we can avoid causing them. To understand what can cause jelly populations to increase, a team of ecologists studied two ocean ecosystems near the southwestern coast of Africa, North Benguela and South Southern Benguela. Northern Benguela is off the coast of Namibia, while Southern Benguela is off the coast of South Africa. A strong ocean current divides Northern Benguela from Southern Benguela. This seems really important. I'm gonna add a note here um, because lots of my students were thinking about how do the currents the jellies. So maybe we'll find something out about that here. These two ecosystems are very similar. Both include populations of jellies, zooplankton, and fish, such as sardines and anchovies, as well as African penguins and Cape fur seals. Humans have fished in both of these ecosystems for a long time. So here is um, a picture that helps us kind of see. These are really pretty close, actually. The team of ecologists studying the two jelly populations analyzed data that had been collected over the last 50 years by other scientists and by fishermen. Based on the samples of jellies counted in each region, they determined that the jelly population increased in northern Benguela, but not in southern Benguela. Interesting. So I'm going to add a note here. Why is one of the moon jelly populations increasing while the other is not? We saw how close they were. They, they both um, 
have the current separating them. So there is a little bit of a difference there. Maybe it has something to do with the current. Today, the population of jellies in northern Benguela is much larger than has ever been recorded there before. Yet, in southern Benguela, the jelly popula population has remained relatively stable. That's so interesting. They're so close to one another. In comparing these two ocean ecosystems, the ecologists found an important difference. Aha. Laws prevented people from catching too many fish in southern Benguela. Huh, well this doesn't tell me anything. What does this have to do with the jellies though? Because this is about fishing laws. In the 1950s, commercial fisheries began to catch large numbers of sardines and anchovies from both northern and southern Benguela. However, starting in the 1970s, people passed laws that limited the number of sardines and other fish that could be caught each year in southern Benguela. In an effort to protect the fish populations there, in contrast, there were no limits placed on fishing in northern Benguela. Without laws limiting the number of fish they could catch in northern Benguela, people caught huge numbers of sardines and other fish there, causing the fish populations to decrease. So I'm going to add a note here so that the fish populations are decreasing really rapidly due to overfishing but again, what does this have to do with the moon jellies? Why did that affect them? And they, this is a decrease, not an increase. By the early 2000s, the fish populations returned to near normal levels in southern Benguela, but had dropped to record low numbers in northern Benguela. In this ecosystem, the jellies do not eat fish and the fish do not eat jellies. Okay, interesting. So that was my guess that maybe the fish would be a resource population, but the fish are not consumer or resource population for the jellies. So how are they related to them? So why, there's our question, why did a decrease in the size of the fish populations in Northern Benguela affect the jelly population? Let's look at the sardine population as an example. Jellies and sardines eat the same food, zooplankton. Aha, so they are in, in competition for their resources, right? Their resource population, we know jellies eat the zooplankton. It looks like the sardines also do. The relationship between jellies and sardines is called competition because they are competing for the same resource population. And there we have it, right? The energy storage molecules are going both to the sardines and the jellies. But these still are not connected. I don't see an arrow between them. When the sardine population decreased due to unlimiting fishing in northern Benguela, fewer sardines were around to eat zooplankton. So, this helps me understand it a little bit. The sardines decreased, meaning less deaths in the zooplankton population. Interesting. And we know when there are less deaths and the same number of births, it doesn't sound like anything was affecting the births, the population will increase. So with fewer zooplankton eaten by the sardines, so less deaths, the zooplankton population increased, leaving more zooplankton for the jellies to eat. So if I, I could add an arrow here, this would be an arrow down, this would be an arrow up, right? Because it was increased, which then we know means an increased ESM, and that means for the jellies, an increased number of births. Interesting. So it's kind of like a domino effect that's happening. 
having a larger resource population made more energy storage molecules available to the jellies. This allowed them to reproduce more. More reproduction led to more births and deaths, so the jelly population increased, just like we were predicting, right? So we had a decrease, an increase, which means increased energy, increased births, increased population. This is how the change in the sardine population was able to affect the jelly population. Even though jellies are not directly connected to sardines on the food web, a change to the sardine population caused the zooplankton population to change, which caused the jelly population to change. Just like we we're saying, kind of that domino effect. This is an example of an indirect effect the result of a chain of causes and effects, where one cause leads to an effect that causes another effect, right? So we've got our one, two, and three. It's kind of like happening over time. In Southern Benguela, the jelly population did not increase. Because of limits on fishing, the fish population in Southern Benguela was relatively stable. This meant the fish consumed the same number of zooplankton as usual, leaving the same number of zooplankton for jellies and not causing any change to the jelly population. In a stable ecosystem, biodiversity, which is the number of different kinds of living things in the ecosystem, also stays the same. Biodiversity is a measurement of how healthy an ecosystem is. This seems really clear. I didn't know this before. Um, so biodiversity is an important measure of health, right? So we can look at how many different types of organisms are in an ecosystem. When an ecosystem becomes less biodiverse, it is because the ecosystem is so unstable that entire populations are dying out. In order to maintain healthy ecosystems, people need to come up with plans like Southern Benguela's fishing limits to help keep ecosystems stable and maintain their biodiversity. I really like this because this is a solution. So this is a solution. It is something humans can do to help, which is, is really great, is to help maintain that biodiversity. Looking at lots of population data helped ecologists figure out what caused the jelly population increase. However, jelly populations are increasing in other ecosystems all over the globe. Since every ecosystem is unique, other jelly increases may have different causes. So we need to, to look at our specific evidence for our main jellies uh, because it might be slightly different, but maybe now we also need to see if there's any competition happening in our moon jellies. Okay, so it seems like what was happening in these two moon jelly populations were that competition was affecting one. In the article, we found out that jellies were competing with something called sardines, a type of fish. Even though the sardines do not eat the jellies and are not eaten by the jellies, they were able to affect them. When there was overfishing occurring and the sardine population was decreasing in size, they were eating the zooplankton less. This meant that there were less deaths in the zooplankton population, and this started to increase. The moon jellies then had more energy storage molecules available to them from the increasing zooplankton population, and they were able to increase by having more births. Notice how one thing caused another caused another. This is called an indirect effect. Two populations can compete for the same resource population. A change to one of these populations affects the size of the other. The result of one cause leading to an effect that causes one or more effects is an indirect effect. Remember, 
The cause all started in the sardine population. That was our decrease. Then the effect was an increase in the zooplankton population because of a decrease in deaths, which then led to our indirect effect, having an increased moon jelly population. There are multiple steps along this cause and effect process. Competition is just one example of an indirect effect. Can you think of any more? If you did, this is what we are going to be talking about in our next lesson. Are there other types of indirect effects that are affecting an ecosystem? And if so, could this be happening in our moon jelly populations? Great work today, guys, and I look forward to keep thinking about this with you in our next lesson. Bye.